The scripture today will be from John 20, 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. All through Lent, we have followed the way. In the footsteps of Jesus, we have seen and heard and learned from the most unlikely situations and the most unlikely people. Most of you know that I worked with children who were mentally challenged for 25 years. And I probably learned more from this unlikely population than I ever could have expected. You'll understand then why this Easter illustration remains one of my favorites. It was a week before Easter, and the middle elementary Sunday school teacher gave each of her children not just a small Easter egg, but one of those large plastic Easter eggs to take home with them. Nothing, of course, was in it, and their directions were to go somewhere and to find something to put in that egg that would say something about what Easter was all about. They were to bring it back to class the next week. Well, you can imagine how excited they were on Easter Sunday to come in and present their eggs to their teacher and to tell why they chose the thing they did to put in it. One by one, the teacher took the egg out of the basket and opened it up. The children explained, and others went, ooh, and ah. You know, kind of like when you have fireworks. <laughs> but they opened those eggs, and they saw them. And as they were open, there was a flower, a new life, a butterfly symbolizing the resurrection. There was a cross, one of those little yellow pom-pom baby chicks. All wonderful symbols of new life. And then the next egg she opened had nothing in it. Somebody didn't follow directions, one child piped up. Another turned and looked at Philip, who was 10, but he had Down syndrome, so he was in the class of the younger students. You're stupid, another one said. And just as the teacher was ready to step in to stop them, Philip spoke up. I did too do it. Jesus wasn't there. The tomb was empty. So's my egg. <laughs> I think he got it, don't you? <laughs> well, you see, today is not the end, but it's the beginning of the story whose good news, bad news, good news theme is played out in our own daily lives and even played out in movies and literature. You just look at the last half century, popular tales like the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lord of the Rings, and yes, even the Harry Potter stories have all shown unlikely heroes making great sacrifices, even laying down their lives to overcome incredible odds and defeat the forces of evil. So on Easter Sunday, that question is put to you and to me, how do these themes resonate in our own lives? How do you and I follow the way of Jesus in, act, in actively loving those who are poor, sick, oppressed, and shut out by the powers of this world? What sacrifices are we willing to make that will benefit others? How does God empower us to overcome <coughs> these things that sins in our own mind? And what does it mean for us to be people who call themselves Resurrection or Easter people. How we answer that question speaks very loudly because it refers to what you might call our defining story. 
It speaks of the narrative of our own lives that shape how you view the world and your place in the world. It is the story that shapes your values and your vision and even shapes how you handle hardship, adversity, and death. For some of us, the defining story of our life may be a given. It may have been determined by the circumstances of our birth, like who our parents were, where we were born, or what happened to us early on. Maybe we have parents who died young. Maybe they got divorced. Maybe we grew up in an alcoholic or an abusive home. Some of us were afforded an education and others weren't. What has life thrown at you, such as disease, disaster, or hardship? Because you see, some of those things, and I dare say all of these things, sometimes tend to scar our lives so severely that we never move past them. And they become our defining story. We get stuck there. Others of us choose our defining story. For those of us who have gathered today, for those of us who have said, yes, my desire is to follow the way of Christ, I would submit to you that our defining story is the Easter story. It is the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that we remember and celebrate today. But it is a choice that we each must make. Because only you can decide which story will define who you are. Our defining story becomes the lens through which we see others. It becomes the guidebook which, through which we journey through life. It becomes the coach's playbook by which we deal with disease and defeat. And it is the hymn book that gives us hope beyond death. We've been journeying together these weeks of Lent through the way. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus with Adam Hamilton, pastor of the Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City. Each Sunday we have tried to walk in his footsteps, seeing where he has walked, and in seeing to ask, who is this Jesus? What was he really like? And more importantly, what does it mean to have a relationship with him today and to be his followers? Remember, we went to the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized, and we learned what a defining experience his baptism was when he heard the voice that said, This is my son, with whom I am well pleased. We saw the wilderness where Jesus was tested and tempted by the devil and grew in his understanding of those times in our own lives where we are tested, where we are tempted. And hopefully we have gained insight and strength in how to remain faithful during those times. After his rejection in the hometown, in his own hometown of Nazareth, we saw how Jesus chose a new base for his ministry, the town of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, and we learned how his fame grew as he cast demons out of those possessed and healed the sick. And it reminded us of our own responsibility as his followers to reach out to those who are sick and suffering in any way. We went to the mountains, one of Jesus' favorite places, places where he went for retreat, as well as to teach. We remember that it was on such a mountain that Matthew tells us he gave his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, in which he talked about what life in the kingdom of God was like. We went to the Sea of Galilee and saw what an influence that was on Jesus. Maybe that's why he chose his disciples there, not seminary graduates, but common, ordinary fishermen. We learned about those things that happened around and on the Sea of Galilee, like when Jesus calmed the storm, and when he called Peter to come to him and walk on water, and how everything was fine until G Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. As we hung out with Jesus, we met the people he liked to hang out with. The very people that others, especially those religious types, scorned. You know who I mean. The sinners, the outcasts, and the poor. Jesus had friends in low places, and he loved them. Even more than he loved the righteous. 
And what we learned was that if Jesus spent time with them, if he took the time to look them in the eye and make them feel valued and important, then we must do the same. Finally, last Sunday on Palm and Passion Sunday, we heard the shocking story of Jesus' final week. Riding into Jerusalem on a humble donkey, being proclaimed king by his followers. And we wondered what kind of king he was. A king who wept over the city and its coming destruction. A king who knelt to wash his disciples' feet. A king who prayed, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thine be done. <clears throat> a king who wore a crown of thorns. A king unjustly accused and abused, sentenced to death, even death on a cross, while all of his followers eventually abandoned. Now to me, this is the most powerful part of the story. Because what good is a defining story if it can't get you through the difficult times of life? I don't want a they lived happily ever after story, or a power of positive thinking story, or a gospel of prosperity story. I want, no, I need a defining story that's going to keep me going when I feel like everything around me is falling apart. I want a story that when the storm rages, I know there's somebody with me who's going to calm those waters. I want someone who's going to keep me going when injustice reigns or friends betray or abandon me, when relationships are destroyed or broken by words, actions, or illness. Isn't that the kind of defining story you want to? You see, it's like Jesus must have felt on the cross. Like he was forsaken. Like he was abandoned. Life is hard. And the story of Jesus is exactly the kind of story that we need to be our defining story. Think of his disciples, of his mother. When they thought it was over, when they thought they had seen the worst, when justice and injustice and evil and death seemed to have won out and prevailed, those women went to the tomb on that first Easter morning, and when they found the stone rolled away and the tomb empty, these unexpected people ran to tell the others and to share the Easter story. Do you remember what the scripture said? Why are you looking for the living one in a cemetery? He is not here. He is raised up. Remember how he told you when you were still back in Galilee that he had to be handed over to sinners, be killed on a cross, and in three days rise again? And they remembered his words. They remembered Jesus' story, which quickly became their story and now becomes our story as well. We know that when the women shared their story with the rest of the disciples, with those closest to Jesus, <laughs> With those who had actually walked in his footsteps, they thought the women were crazy. Here are people who should believe more than anyone else, and they don't. Yes, it seems impossible, but they wanted proof. And don't you hear that from people today? I don't know if I believe. Where's the proof? They've been asking that for years. Clarence Jordan was a southern preacher in the 1900s, and he had the best answer to this request. He said, the proof that God raised Jesus from the dead was not the empty tomb, but the full hearts of his transformed and changed disciples. The crowning evidence that Jesus was alive was not a vacant grave, but a spirit-filled fellowship, not a rolled-away stone, but a carried-away church. It's about people whose lives are different. It's about people who have learned to walk the way of Jesus, to travel his way in the way that they deal with people. His way that speaks of the ongoing jo joy that he has been raised, not just he is risen, 
And that, my friends, makes all the difference in the world. It is our defining story that helps us handle whatever life throws our way. And if we have the faith to believe it, if we choose to make Jesus' story our story, what we find is that, we'll that it will carry us through our lives to the end of our days. Because as our defining story, it tells us those things. It tells us that though we are sinners or outcasts or poor or whatever else we feel ourselves to be, God loves us. It tells us that when we suffer, as all suffer, God is with us. It tells us that the end is never the end. The worst thing is not the last thing, and there is always hope. It tells us that there is grace for our journey, forgiveness for our sin, that love is stronger than hate, goodness is stronger than evil, and life is stronger than death. We've learned that death is not the last word. Violence is not the last word. Hate is not the last word. Money is not the last word. Intimidation is not the last word. Political power is not the last word. And condemnation is not the last word. Betrayal and failure are not the last word. No! Each of them are left like the rags that were found in the empty tomb. The tomb from which Christ arose. In his book, Adam Hamilton says that every Easter after preaching, invariably he gets asked this question. Preacher, do you really believe this? And he says that his answer every time is the same. He says, I not only believe it, I'm counting on it. I'm counting on the fact that God walks with us through our suffering. I'm counting on the fact that God's name is love. I'm counting on the fact that forgiveness triumphs over our own brokenness. I'm counting on the fact that God promises to bring us hope for the future. I'm counting on the fact that life has conquered death. I'm counting on the fact that we have a mission and a calling to fulfill that which will help bring the kingdom of God to earth. I not only believe, I'm counting on it. Is that your defining story? Can you say that with confidence today? I'd like you to just close your eyes for a minute as we close in a time of prayer. I'm going to just invite you to pray to God in the quiet. He hears you, you know. Maybe you're here and it's been a long time since you time ago since you decided to follow Jesus. Maybe you've never ever made that decision. But maybe today you're ready to say, yes, I want this to be my defining story. And if you do, just whisper this prayer. Yes, Jesus, I want to follow you. I trust in this defining story. On the cross, you offer me forgiveness. You show us that you are always with us. And I trust this. I trust that in your resurrection you triumph. You triumph over the grave, over sin, and over hate. I trust this. Help me to follow you. Help me to serve you and help me to live with hope as I follow the way and seek to walk in your footsteps. Amen.